All right, guys, here I am live coming to you here from BHD Studios. And until I learn OBS, I'm going to just do a ghetto intro music coming from my iPad. You guys let me know if you guys recognize the music, all right? Let us begin. Click, click, click. Hello everyone and welcome to BHT Studios and welcome to BHT Live. And today's what's on my feet, is that what I said I would call it? What's on my feet is the Adidas Oswego TRs and it, to me everything looks backwards and reversed or is that, is that just me? The camera looks weird. But uh, here we go. I like the design of this. It has nice hits of rubber here and has a toe cap. And this is a ripstop material. And it's nicely winterized. Nice mixture of different materials. Has leather along here. And uh, yeah, and it uses the Addy Cream midsole, which some of the, the um, what are they called? The Yeezys still use. And so this is a really cool winterized sneaker. And that's what's on my feet. Now I'm going to stop this music now. So welcome to my live show. And like I said, once I get the OBS going, I'm going to actually have a proper music intro. And I also put my microphone a little bit closer. Someone last week complained and said it was there was too much echo. I do need a little bit more sound deadening material, but having the microphone a little bit closer to my mouth definitely does help. And so that's why this seems more intrusive than it was the last week and the week before that. And of course, I started off using my Fujifilm X Pro 3 because in the title I said, let's talk about Fujifilm. But then I think I put or whatever else you want to talk about. So whenever I do these lives, I just have a plethora of gear around me because I never know which way the conversation will sway and what type of audience I'm going to get. So let me just look over here to my uh, live chat section here. And I've been talking to Boris pre, uh, pre show because I didn't realize that I can actually do the live chat. And is everything backwards, guys? Like, let me know. First of all, is the audio good? And does this B and C, is that backwards? Because I, I like it the other way around. And I'm not sure if I can switch it around anymore. But let me just see here. Um, and did any guys recognize the music that I had for the intro? Uh, you think the focus speaking should work when using a adapter on vintage Helios in video mode? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I uh, I could try it now. I have, you mean like on your Fujifilm? Because Fujifilm's um, uh, focus speaking wasn't that great and it's just gotten better over time, so. Let me just let me just test that. If I have a little bit of time uh, during the this live show, I'll definitely give it a try. I don't have a Helios. I do have old Minolta. Like this is an old Minolta MD MC Rocor lens. Is everything backwards? Everything looks backwards to me. The text and everything is reversed. So, oh, and Travis saying that the the audio is clipping. Yeah. See, maybe that's a problem. I talk loud. So let me just pull this back a bit. And then I'll twist this closer to me here. So Travis, let me know. Is that a little bit better? I, I tend to talk loud too because I don't get feedback of my own volume. And maybe that's why podcasters will wear headphones so they can self-monitor their own volume, but I can't. So let me know if that's a little bit better. Yeah, you are not, uh, you are not mirrored. So that means that's good, right, Travis? Not mirrored means... Um, like this is mirrored. I, I see it mirrored. Like everything is backwards. But is is it backwards to you guys? Um, from Italy. How's it going? Boba? Is that the X Pro 3? Yes, it is. This is my X Pro 3 in Dura Black, which as you can see gets very very fingerprinty. And if you don't like that, then I would recommend not to get the any of the Dura finishes. But because I like shooting with old film cameras, I'm used to patina. And so if you don't like patina, then get the standard black finish X-Pro 3. Oh, oh, Travis, thank you. You are not mirrored. Okay, 
Because for some reason, I am mirrored, but you guys aren't seeing it that way. And that happened, I think, two shows ago as well, where everything was mirrored on me. Um, actually, it didn't start off mirrored, and then it became mirrored. And maybe it's for my own sake, so that when I move my right hand in the video, it's my left hand, but it's on the same side, like like mirror, to help me. But I don't like that. I like, and then I wish Instagram Live allowed to do this as well as of a non mirrored video because I'm showing people things like with text in it. And, you know, like, here we go. I'm going to just flex a little bit. Here's my Nikon 35 Ti. And see, I see that backwards, but you guys aren't, right? You guys can actually read Nikon 35 Ti. And so um, I don't like doing that on Instagram Live. I don't like that everything is mirrored. And I'm glad at least for you guys that it's not mirrored so you guys can see everything. And uh, Boris saying sounds good and looks good. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I've been slowly trying to improve my video. And in a way, you guys are my uh, help me sort of improve. I will get OBS going so that then I can do screen sharing and I can then share photos, but as well as show you some of my workflows. Because I know some people have been asking me, hey, Take, how do you how do you process your classic neg photos? Mine don't look so great what do you what what magic sauce are you using what special filters are you using i nothing i just it's mostly has to do with white balance most of it is if you can figure it out when you're shooting it that's better because sometimes classic neg just doesn't look good in certain scenes but some of the ones that i know will look great in classic negative film simulation, it still needs to be tweaked a little bit. Uh, it tends to be a bit magenta for me. I don't like that magenta look. Some people said, well, that's what the old film look. To me, well, maybe because I shot a lot of Fuji, Fuji tended to be a little bit more green in the film days and Kodaks tend to have more of a magenta. And that's why people like the Kodak Portra film. It, it's really good for skin tones. Fuji film is great for landscape and maybe for, sh I mean, both is great for street. But the strength of Kodak was portrait, really nice skin tones. And Fujifilm was more of a versatile overall type film. And so anyway, so that way, again, if I get OBS going, I can get my intro music going. And can anyone uh, tell me where that music came from? Let me try to pick that up here. Expo 3 Dura Black or Dura Silver. This is Dura. This is the Dura Black. But because of the way the light is hitting it, so maybe this looks more like Dura Black now. Because this way... My my LED light is hitting it directly and it's reflecting. So, uh, can you give me the email of who can make me an ex photographer? I need the love. Uh, there is actually no specific email that you can ask. I think they do their own curation. I forwarded photographers that I thought were really good that could become ex photographers. But uh, other than that, yeah, they, they have their own internal team that scouts the world. And remember, there's ex-photographers per country, and there's also a global ex-photographer thing. So depending on what you're going for. But, you know, when they first started, there weren't that many pro photographers using Fujifilm. And so they kind of were picking any pro that was shooting Fujifilm. And now they've gotten pickier. If you notice from the beginning, they've removed some ex-photographers and they've added some newer ones because now there's more higher caliber photographers or higher even, uh, you know, the more famous ones, the more popular ones. Because, you know, in the end, it's not a meritocracy. It's, it's, it's marketing, right? It's branding, it's marketing. And they'll pick the photographers that they feel that can help them sell more cameras because in the end they're business right they're not a non-profit organization so it is a political thing um in some countries i know recently uh fujifilm usa picked more uh, diversity which i actually think that's good you know they pick more female photographers more uh, uh black skin brown skin asian i'm not sure if there's any asian oh they do have Rinzi, but that was even before that right but uh, hispanic asian photographers to show more of a diversity because fujifilm shooters are a diverse group of of shooters and in terms of professional photographers if they're all just middle-aged white men they may all be fantastic photographers and i'm sure they are but it is nice to show the diversity of the type of photographers and people want to see representation right if you're a female photographer you want to see other great female photographers that are shooting fujifilm and i think saiza uh 
what's her last name now? Banaki, Banaka. Uh, she's a, a Filipino uh, F- a Fujifilm ex photographer. I think she's part of the global. She's a great photographer, and again, great representation of the diversity of the type of people that shoot with Fujifilm cameras. Uh, let me just try to catch up here. Morning from Indonesia. What time is? Oh, two a.m. Yeah, I'm sorry, Rio. I know that me picking this time would mess with a lot of my Asian. Uh, followers. I had a, uh, been talking to a couple of people in Japan and in Hong Kong, and they're like, why did you pick this time? It's a good time for North America, and it's a good time for me, but it's not great for Asia. So um, I will try to pick a different time uh, next week as well to cater to uh, to Asia. You know, the best time for you guys is actually probably 2 a.m. my time. So maybe one day I will do a 2 a.m. show just so that you guys will get a morning show. So so sorry that it's so early for you, but you know this is being recorded and you can watch again. So hopefully uh, sometime in the near future, I will pick a good time for you. And also Camera Girl complained and said, hey, Taki, you're not going through every line because I'm just kind of picking and choosing. So sorry about that. Uh, from the London OC2 fish 07. That sounds like a password. You better change that if that's your banking password. Um, good morning. Oh, good evening. Oh, this evening in the UK. So this is also good for Europe and the UK. And greetings from London. Very good. One of my good friends just moved to London, but he doesn't want me to tell anyone yet. But that will be coming up sometime soon. Fuji XT3. Yeah, the XT3 is a great camera. And thank you, uh, all these, for letting me know that it's not reversed. It's reversed for me. And there must be something in here that lets me not have it reversed, but I'm not going to waste my time reversing it for you guys. And so can you talk about the durability of the X-Pro3 Dura finish? Yeah, I. it's a weird finish. The, the DuraTech technology, if you do a bit of research, it actually was invented by Citizen, the watch company, because Citizen has had... Um, titanium watches for a long time. This is a Tissot, but uh, they've invented, because in general, titanium is actually a soft metal. You can scratch the surface of titanium quite easily. It's softer than aluminum, I think. The thing is, over time, the scratches disappear because because it's so malleable, the scratches will go away. So you don't need to polish titanium as much as you do need to polish stainless steel if you do get scratches on the surface. But because of that, that malleability of titanium and its softness, uh, Citizen invented this Duratec technology that puts a diamond-like coating over and on top of the, the, the titanium uh, material here. And because of it, it is, it's, it's kind of a matte finish, but actually what it is is because of the, the, the carbonized, the little bits of diamond, you can actually like, I'm just rubbing my, my fingernail and you can see a little bit of my fingernail. Now, it looks like I scratched the finish, but it didn't. That's just the scuzz off my fingernails coming off on the on the on that hard carbonized surface. And now as you can see, it's gone. You can see my fingerprints. Let me, let me get rid of my fingerprints. I use my shirt to wipe it. You can see that now. See, that wasn't scratched in the surface, but there are some finish issues. And I'll, I'll show you guys. Um, I did notice, and I haven't even talked to Fujifilm about it. Look right where my thumb grip is here. Do you see that right over, right over there, right over there? It looks like there's a bit of chipping off the thumb grip. Now that is exactly where it would actually. You can even see a scratch. Can you see that scratch there? The little white line there. There is a scratch on. There is a scratch on the Duratec surface. And again, for me, that, that doesn't bother me. That's, that's, that's metal. I like patina. I don't mind the scratches on these. And, and, and to be honest, I think if this was the black paint uh, X-Pro3, that would have definitely gone right through. So definitely this Duratec finish is stronger than just a standard black paint finish that Fujifilm will put on their standard black. I think it's just an anodized black paint uh, technology. Duratec is going to be stronger, but it's not unscratchable. Not, nothing is, right? Like, other than maybe diamonds, and even diamonds, they might not scratch, but they can shatter. But 
So that's that's the issue that I've had on the Duratec surface uh, finish. I'm I'm not rough with my gear. I'm I'm pretty careful, so I don't know where those scratches came from. So again, like I said, I haven't talked to Fujifilm about it, and I will ask them. So that's my thoughts on the Duratec finish. Um, all these, I just checked it. Thanks for the peaking. It works. It has to be in manual mode. Yeah. That's the one thing. If you do have a Fujifilm camera and you have a, um, a manual focus lens, that's not a Fujifilm lens. Um, you have to be in manual mode. You have to go to manual like this and then you'll see the focus peaking. And I think they should just allow peaking in either mode. There is a mode where if you're using a Fujifilm lens, and you do have autofocus on, but you want to do a manual focus override, I think peaking still kicks in. And if it doesn't, I think you have to press one of the custom buttons, like half press, and then the peaking will show up. But other than that, if you have a third party lens on there, you need to be in manual mode. So thanks for checking yourself. I think that's, uh, that's, that's good. I don't need to test it. Suave Nation asking me here. Oh, see, some, something happened here. Suave Vision. Buy a Rodecaster Pro. Yeah, I know. I mean, I actually had um, Blue send me this microphone, and they're actually sending me the Blue Compass microphone, the uh, the arm. And so I'm going to play with this first. I wasn't – I mean, beggars, beggars can't be choosers, but they sent the silver version. I wish they sent me the black one. So now this – you know, imagine this is like this. It really stands out. I do like something that's black. And it's a little bit more discreet, but they did send me this, and I I promised uh, I promised Blue, which is actually owned by Logitech. I promised them that I would use this, but can you please send me out the stand? Because if I put the table, if put it down, this is all you see, and I think it looks a bit odd. It would be nicer if you can at least have a, a different angles for it. So I will maybe try the Rodecaster Pro, but again, um, I'm not gonna buy it because. I'm not saying that Road should send me one, but if if Blue is going to be sending me microphones anyways, might as well just work with Blue, right? So uh, I'm going to be setting this up. But the problem is there is an audio delay when you use um, – th there's a feature in OBS that allows you to adjust the audio delay from the video because the reason why I'm using my Rode Video Micro is because I'm – actually, this is connected to my X-T4. And then from my X-T4, I'm doing HDMI out and then using a video capture card. And so the audio video syncing should be pretty good. I think the audio still lags behind sometimes based on the, the stream. But um, that's why I'm doing it this way. Once I get OBS – and then once I set up an external UB, uh, USB type mi uh, microphone, then I can adjust the the video and audio delay in the app so that you get proper syncing of my lips to my voice. And so I'll work that all out. Um, it's just a matter of how much time I invest in doing these live shows and how successful these live shows are. So thank you. Right now there's 38 of you and I got uh, eight thumbs up. So thank you for the thumbs up. If I get more thumbs up, I'd appreciate it. So let's uh, move on here. Can simulation bracketing create only two images instead of three? Um, if you're talking about the Fujifilm, I'm pretty sure Fujifilm uh, bracketing is three. It's always been three. I haven't done it recently. But let me just see your drive mode. Um, bracketing should be three. I don't know why yours is two. Unless I'm wrong here, guys. Unless you guys could um, bracketing, film simulation bracketing. I'm going to just take a picture here. And let's just see how many versions I get. One. Oh, and you get one version. Two. No, there you go. No, mine has three. Film simulation bracketing in Fujifilm is three images, not two. All right. Alberto made it to a live on YouTube. Welcome, Alberto. Wherever you're coming in from, let me know where you're coming in from. Rio, it's okay, Taki. We still love you here. Oh, in terms of the timing, are you, Rio, are you, you're from Indonesia, right? Yeah, sorry that it's so late. 2 a.m., what are you doing up at 2 a.m.? I'm watching Big Head Tacos live stream. I appreciate it. 
Alberto saying, imagine if Kodak did as well as Fuji. Yeah, you know, Fuji, there was that, that, that book that came out from the president of Fuji film that talked about that transition. I don't think he's president anymore. But that was a very difficult transition. Like Fuji film in the 1990s, number two camera manu uh, sorry, film manufacturer in the world, just behind uh, Kodak. And at, even in the 90s, Fujifilm realized that there was going to be a transition. And Kodak, like Blockbuster, and like a lot of American large co corporations like Polaroid, I think uh, sometimes the strength of being a mighty American powerhouse is that you assume that like the rest of the world will just conform to you, right? So a lot of companies, if you're successful in the U.S., you don't really care about global markets, which is less so today. More and more American companies realize, look, if you want to make a lot of money, you got to penetrate Europe, you got to penetrate Asia, you have to penetrate Africa, depending on you know what product you have. Um, sometimes to their detriment, because some companies that went into China, which is a quick, easy buck, but they re you know then they soon realize there's a lot of political uh, issues there as well and they can as easily boycott your product and now you've invested this huge infrastructure in China and then they ban your products and then all of a sudden you're in serious trouble but in general 90s USA Kodak Blockbuster Polaroid there's a lot of these huge companies that basically felt they were untouchable and that they can just keep on doing what they're doing. They're only worried about quarterly profits and they weren't really looking to future-proof their pro uh, their business. And it's not just North America. I shouldn't just say that because Eggfoot took a huge hit. Um, Konica took a huge hit. A lot of Japanese companies sort of did the same thing. Nikon is a perfect modern day example as well as Olympus. They were just riding on the coattails of their previous success, ignoring what was happening in the marketplace. But Kodak is a good example because those of us that remember going up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s will know that Kodak is like what Amazon is today or what Walmart is today. They were just everywhere. Every billboard you looked at, a company that can sponsor the Olympics, a company that can sponsor, uh, you know, uh, a racing event, sporting events. They can name... Um, stadiums after their company and there's billboards everywhere every magazine you turn to even a magazine that's non-photographic and there's a Kodak ad you know that they have serious cash and that's kind of how big Kodak was and they definitely um, were very arrogant and this is coming from someone who worked at Kodak for a decade I worked for them for 10 years so I understood the inner workings of Kodak and I quit because I realized there's no future here this company is dying and they are making us work twice as hard for the same amount of money. Because as they shut down regional offices, they put more work on us that stuck around. And so I just left because I realized there's there's nothing left for me to do here. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wish success to Kodak still. But I think they are a decade behind if they think they're going to catch up to Fujifilm overnight. Fujifilm was planning for this transition 10 years before the... The, the 2003 or 2002 plunge of film sales. They were already preparing themselves for this. And they realized that they would become this huge company to a much smaller company because there just wasn't going to be a demand for film. And they couldn't keep all their staff. They couldn't keep all their factories. Like there was a film factory in the United States. They had to shut it down. There just wasn't the sales that could justify keeping a factory open. They probably had multiple factories globally. They probably had one for just South Asia. They probably had one for Africa, one or two for Europe. They'd have one for the USA. They had multiple in Japan. I mean, and then when film sales plummeted, all those uh, factories that were overseas just had to be shut down. They kind of regrouped in Japan and slowly started expanding again. So now Fujifilm has factories in Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, China, Japan, but nothing yet in North America. It'd be nice to see a North American uh, uh, factory that maybe they would make the GFX cameras in North America. I think they could do that because they are struggling to keep up their production in Japan. If you know a lot of the premium cameras like the X-Pro3, the X100V, the entire GFX lineup, they're all being made in Japan. And the reason why the X-Pro3, they came out with a black one first, and then the Dura Black second, and then Dura Silver, they were 
sort of like, I think like weeks, like three weeks or a month apart because they were all being made in Japan and the factory couldn't produce the cameras fast enough. to. So they had to do that. So if they had a USA factory and so for their premium cameras for North America and make them in North America and then for the rest of the world and maybe even North America, Europe, and then for the rest of the world, make them in the Japanese factory. Because right now, Fujifilm is having issues. They just built a new factory in, in Japan as well. And so it's going to help them with Japanese production. But that's another reason why the X-T4, like a lot of people are like, oh, the X-T4 is made in China. Well, they just can't make them fast enough in Japan. That's the problem. When they need to create volume, it goes to China because their factory is able to uh, produce cameras quicker at higher production, but at high quality in China. Just because, you know, all iPhones are made in China. It's an American company, but uh, they just can't make them in the U.S. for the quantity and the quality that they want to hit at the price point they want to hit. But I think the GFX lineup, there should be more margins. Like any of the cameras that are made in Japan, they're more expensive and hence the margins are, are greater, but they need to take a little bit more care in the, um, the production quality of these cameras. Uh, not to say that the ones in China aren't uh, the, of high quality, but I do believe that the ones, if they are made in Japan, they are of higher quality, but you also have to think about components. Not every component is manufactured in Japan, right? And so even component wise, some of these parts are probably still coming from China, uh, like the circuit boards and uh, other parts, but it's the matter of assembly, right? And so and that's my, uh, my two bits on manufacturing. Hello from Germany. Hello, Robert, how's it going? Thanks for joining and Momento coming from the UK. Yeah, I think from the UK. And to be honest, my in terms of my followers, my number one followers globally for YouTube is the USA. And number two is the UK. And I think number three is Germany. The Germans love Big Head Taco or maybe the German just like cameras. And then I think it's Canada and then it's Asia. But Asia is huge. So that's another reason why I kind of did this is to see how many of my U.S. and European followers will come on versus my Asian followers. Um, I have more followers in Europe than in Asia, but it doesn't mean that most of my European followers will actually come to a live show. I may actually have more out of Asia come to join. So we'll see what happens. I'm going to move this around the time. But I'm going to try to keep it Thursday, Friday. It's the end of the week. So things have happened throughout the week. And then I could talk about that. So that's why I kind of picked Friday. Although I think Monday is also good of what happened the previous week. And then let's talk about, you know, what happened the previous week. This one, we could talk about what happened this week. Or we could talk about old stuff like, like, like the X70. I just brought this next to me just in case we talk about it. I have, you know, my old film cameras just in case I want to talk about it. And as well, I have my X100F, just in case we want to talk about it. And also, I showed you my, my Nikon 35Ti, as well as the Ricoh GR, GR3. I do have this here. I just have all my gear surrounding me so that in case we talk about stuff, I don't need to get up and go off camera. I did that, I think, last week, and I was gone for about 30 seconds. But I think when you're on a live show, 30 seconds feels like forever. Um, Reno. Sorry, let me just. It's weird. It shifts when I when I try to look through the um, comments here. I think it's because more and more questions are coming in along the bottom. And when I touch the screen with my mouse, it, the whole thing kind of shifts. So sorry, I'm going to try to be better at this. My wife did get angry at me last week, said, stop missing comments. But camera girl's working today, so I don't have to worry about that. Reno's just talking about reading my, my X-Pro3 articles. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, I write articles two times a month, and actually now I've been asked to do a third article, but it's for the it's for the subscription magazine. So I'm going to be writing three articles a month for Fuji Love. And so if I haven't reviewed it here, I've done an article on Fuji Love. And I will start a series. I did start a series already where I would create a Fuji Love article into a YouTube video. Because some people don't want to read, right? They just want to see a video version of my articles. And other people, they prefer to read. They'd rather have things in print. And so um, it's just a matter of time. You know, I could create 
two videos a month just recreating my Fuji Love article to make a YouTube version. I just don't have the time to do it, unfortunately. That's why I'm doing these live shows so I can at least do once a week live and answer your questions that I'm not doing so great at answering right now. So let me just sort of catch up here. Reno, on the edge of buying an X100V, but the X-Pro3 looks even better. Yeah, I've been getting this question a lot. Uh, X-Pro3 or the X100V. For me, I picked the X-Pro3, but I do think for a lot of people, the X100V makes more sense. Um, I just like the titanium finish. I think it makes it more of an exotic camera, just like the, the Nikon 35Ti, the T... You know, the Contax T-Series, the Minolta TC1, the Nikon 35 Ti, the T all stood for titanium. They're, they're all made out of an exotic metal. And so having a modern digital camera made out of titanium, it just is such a cool factor. And I do like this reversible LCD screen. Now, I know guys that hated it. A lot of my buddies who said, Taka, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And then when I let them try it, they're like, Actually, this is pretty darn good. Or worst case, they said, okay, it's not as bad as I thought it would be. I still prefer a face-out LCD screen, but I can see the benefits of this. That's the worst comment I got. No one that I actually showed and let them play with it for five or ten minutes, none of them said, I still hate it. I think it's dumb. They all at least said, I understand it. So I do like this reverse articulating screen. Now, I, I knew 100% that because there was such a backlash, but uh, you know, these are keyboard commenters. These are people that not actually played with it, but just kind of immediately, as soon as they see it, they just quickly said something negative. Fujifilm, Fujifilm said, oh wow, we can't put this on the X100V. Uh, this is our flagship all-in-one camera. And they took the safe route and put a regular LCD screen on the X100V. But I think they should have done the same thing as the X-Pro3. They should have made the X100V titanium. And they should have put this reverse LCD screen then I think I would have picked the X100V. But because it didn't have the reverse LCD screen, because it didn't have titanium, I ended up thinking, you know what, I'm going to just keep my X-Pro3. But I think that is kind of a, a thing with Fujifilm. Those that love that vintage vibe of Fujifilm cameras, it's like X-Pro3, X100V, and hopefully there's an X-E4. And then X-E4 comes out, now there's three vintage vibe Fujifilm cameras. Uh, cameras that people can choose from. And I think I would actually have a hard time choosing between an XE4 and an X100V because those cameras are really great for vlogging and for days off because this is my day off camera. Um, it's not heavy, but the X100V is definitely much lighter than this. And I would have liked to have a, a lighter. And that's why I usually shoot with primes on my day off. Uh, not that I wouldn't appreciate a zoom, but zooms are just like, this is my main zoom lens right now is the the 16 to 80 which i think is a great travel lens it's a great compromise it's a 24 to 105 i think equivalent on on oh, tw sorry 28 a 24 to 120 on full frame and i think this is a great uh, a great lens for for travel it's an f4 but it's a constant aperture it works great with my my 10 to 24, because that's also an F4 constant, and it uses the same 72 mil filter today, so I can share filters between the two cameras, but I think it's a great zoom lens, but there, it, you, have to, you have to carry around that extra size and weight. The 28 to 55 F2, 8 to F4 is definitely a more compact, light lens, and if you're looking for compact and light, then go for that, but optically, and in terms of the focal range, you're going from the beginning of ultra-wide to um, mid telephoto so that's why i think i think that this is a great lens uh neil chat saying that you have a canon 7 77d and a couple of cheap primes thinking of picking up an xt3 and 16 to 55 used goodbye it's definitely a good buy i mean the 77d is a i'm pretty sure that's uh that's a cropped aps-c canon right so it's not a matter of you going from a 7D and I would say, oh, well, you know, there's a, you're going from full frame to APS-C, which there's nothing wrong with that. But just so you know that, you know, what you do get is higher uh, ISO performance and blah, 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 blah. But since you're coming from a cropped 
DSLR. I think going from an X, going from a 77D to an XT3 and a 65 drive is a good choice. Definitely. Um, the one big thing you'll notice is battery drain. And that has nothing to do with the, the actual physical battery, but because you're shooting with a, a DSLR, most of the time um, you're not using the EVF, right? You're using just the actual Pentaprism SLR. And so you're going to get more battery drain. So make sure you buy extra batteries. And also the battery in the XC3, the NPW126S, isn't a great battery either. So I would recommend at least three batteries. Get the one that comes with the camera and buy two extra ones. Okay, I'm going to actually look for questions now and not just for quotes. I'm going to try to catch up here, right, guys? I'm going to try to catch up here. Alberto Singh from in New York City. Welcome. Oh, man, I'm way behind. I can see someone talking about my worldwide fan network. I was talking about timing. That was like 10 minutes ago. Okay, someone, uh, Corb, talking about reading my Fujilove articles. Thank you for reading those. Ken, talking about tunnel vision of corporations, definitely. Sony was smart. I mean, they made a lot of mistakes as well, but they definitely made some really smart decisions when it came to the digital. They really screwed up their music and their business, didn't they? They ended up buying Columbia House, they ended up buying, you know, like Sony Pictures, Columbia Music, all, all that, like, that was other existing companies they bought up to control music and movie media so that would help them with their their devices, with their Walkman, with their DVD players, with their Blu-ray, and then everything went streaming, right? Where they let Apple, a computer company, take over their Walkman business, their portable music business that they had monopolized since the late 70s. It was all Sony. And then a computer company walked in and took that business away from them. So Sony screwed up their music player industry, their business. And they also kind of got run over with their mobile phone. The Japanese controlled this. Everyone thinks, even like when I watch YouTube videos and guys like MKBHD and stuff, they talk about the smartphone business and how Apple wasn't the first. And they're showing like Blackberries and some weird Nokia stuff. Japan had smartphones in the 90s. Really cool smartphones. Emojis came out of Japan. Um, people in North America think Apple invented emojis. It just took a Unicode standard that was standardized in Japan, invented by SoftBank in Japan, I think. And that was invented like in 1998. So Japan had emojis in 98. And smartphones in Japan were around since the late 90s. And so smartphones started there. Panasonic, Toshiba, Sharp, Sony, they had amazing smartphones. And again, they allowed a computer company to take over their business because they just didn't adapt because it was um, Galapagos thinking, right? It was a Japan only with the exception of maybe Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong because they tend to kind of buy into the Japanese electronic culture as well as culture in general. They kind of buy into whatever Japan, Japanese culture is selling, if you can call it that. But the rest of the world were just oblivious to what was happening in Japan especially when it came to consumer electronics in the 80s and 90s, it was very insular, like mini disc, uh, digital audio, audio tapes, super beta, that kind of stuff was very Asian centric. But uh, again, Sony let that business go. But when it came to Sony PlayStation, when it came to digital photography, Sony killed it. They did a great job. Um, let me see here. From Portugal, hello from Portugal. Another UK viewer, Jonathan. Thanks for joining, Jonathan. Again, I got another big leap in my video here. I don't know what happened there. Should I just go right to the start, like the newest, and then go backwards? I don't even know how far back this leap me. Oh, not, not too bad. Jonathan from the UK, thanks for joining. You do have a question here, though. Um, you have a Minolta 7000, but I'd like to look at the price of the 9XI. You seem to like it. Is it worth it? Oh, the 9XI, first of all, you should only be paying around between 100 to about 150 US for it. And definitely it's worth it. It's my favorite Minolta cheap pro SLR. So Fujifilm, I mean Fujifilm, Minolta created three pro bodies. The Minolta 9000, the Minolta 9XI, and the Minolta 9. The 9 is the best, okay? 
The 9000 is really quirky and unreliable. The non XI is super cheap, and it's the same shutter that's in the Maxim, the, the Minolta 9 is in the 9XI. The 9XI has its own problems and issues, but for 100 to 150 bucks, to me, I could buy four 9XIs for the price of one Minolta 9. And that's why I like the 9XI. I, I, I own two of them, and I actually might buy a third one, but I still do want a Maxim 9 or Dynax 9. I think they're awesome. All right, so again, I'm gonna avoid comments, guys, but you guys can see each other's comments, right? Um, I'm gonna just do shout outs if someone says hi, and if I miss you, I apologize. Z, hello from China, hello. Thanks for joining, Z. Ken, did Minolta ever really become a pro camera like Nikon Canon? Yeah, that's a, a, that's a really good question that you're asking, Ken. When we think pro, we think probably sports and photojournalism. And in those markets, no, Minolta and Pentax, Pentax never penetrated that market, never did. It was pretty much 90% Nikon and Canon when it came to sports, um, photojournalism, that kind of stuff. But when it came to fine art, 35 mil, hiking, you know, like like mountaineering, let's just say you are a mountain climber slash photographer, birding, that kind of stuff. Minolta actually had quite a large following in Europe and in Asia, but not in North America. And as I always say, Minolta had better glass than Canon and Nikon. And I, I say that quite wholeheartedly in the 80s and 90s, definitely. They thought more about, like I said, most of the pro lenses had circular nine blade aperture um, I irises were Nikon Canon. They're doing sports and doc photo documentary. They don't care about bokeh. Minolta, they, I, I, they didn't coin the phrase bokeh, but Minolta shooters coined the phrase bokeh and Japanese Leica shooters coined because they were using cine glass, right? On the, like the Anginos and the Canoptics. And so they're the guys that coined that term bokeh in the 80s because of the Minolta glass and the Leica and the cine glass that they're using. Because Minolta really cared about out of focus. If you look at old Minolta glass, the APD uh, technology that was in the Fujifilm, the 5612 APD, well, Minolta had that technology already in their glass in the 80s and 90s. They really cared about the out of focus area. And so I would say there were pros using Minolta, but they weren't photojournalists and they weren't sports photographers. They were fine art photographers. But then you think, well, if you were fine art, then you were using medium format. And that is true. But there were some that cared about size and weight. And they were happy enough. You know, this is the era of Kodachrome, right? So some of these guys were like, I'm going to shoot Ektachrome or Kodachrome and shoot slide. And I'm climbing, climbing Mount Everest. I'm not bringing a Pentax 6.7. So I'm going to uh, bring a Minolta body and some of their favorite Minolta glass. Because Minolta did have a 600 F4, a 500 4.5, a 400 F4, a 300 2.8, uh, two, uh, 80 200 2 8. They had all the glass that if you were a pro, they had all the glass that you needed. But it just wasn't as popular. Like, who cared that your 300 2.8 had a circular iris? You're shooting sports. They didn't really care about the bokeh. So that is a very good question, though. I was in the middle of that era where I was a – because I also was a commercial photographer. I shot sports. I shot for the BC Lions here in town for three seasons. And I um, – I was the only guy on the field with the 300 F 2.8 Minolta. And people were like, oh, what, what's this weird guy shooting with Minolta? And they're even looking at my bodies going like, what, what body is that? I've never seen that. And they assumed I was shooting with a Canon or Nikon. They're like, I didn't even know Minolta made a 300 2.8. So, yeah, let me just try to catch up here. Uh, thanks. Someone mentioned about liking my recent champagne court video with Mr. Chan. Yeah, I have three more videos. Un unedited videos with Mr. David Chan and I'm going to produce them eventually, but I can't, that's not, you know, like going back to the archives, I can't, I can't spend that kind of time. If I had an assistant, I would work with me. I could send them all this stuff and I have over 50 videos minimum. I actually think I have closer to a hundred. So let's just round it out and say, I have 75 videos that I've shot, but I haven't edited. 
75 videos. So I can go almost a year without even creating new content, but then that's not good for, for me. And so I'm going to try at least once a month, uh, maybe even more. But I just discovered while I looked for that Mr. David Chan video, I found another one. I'm like, oh, I haven't produced this one yet. So we'll see. Where is that big microphone? Hey, Robert. Yeah, I have to. Um, oh, maybe that's an old comment. Yeah, this you're talking about this one here? Yeah, this is the uh, Blue Yeti. This is a lot of uh, podcasters like using. There is a black version of this. And, but uh, Blue sent this out to me. And so I should, and they are sending out the, uh, the boom arm as well. So I'm going to try using it, but I need to use OBS so I don't get any lag. Let me just catch up here. Bob Boba asking if the Viltrox 8518 is going to damage the X mount of the X Pro line. I don't remember if the Viltrox 85 have an issue, but definitely the Viltrox. 33 and the uh, 56 definitely. In fact, I will, I, will, I will do this just for you guys. I will show you why people are saying there's an issue. The issue has to do with this. Look how close the lens release button is from the mount. It's very tight. It's super close. And what happens is you can even see a little bit of a scratch. See that scratch The very where the mount and the button meet? That's actually a scratch. And I think one of the Viltrox lenses might have done it. Now, if you look at an X-H1, look at that distance. Look how much distance there is between that button and that mount, right? About a half an inch distance. And again, look at the X-Pro3. Look how close it is. It's almost touching. And so when I mount this Viltrox, I'll do it just for you guys. When I mount this Viltrox, Right, let's just try to show you here. When I mount it, look at that. Can you guys see it? It's almost touching. It's almost touching. See that? See how close that is? And then when you take it, and when you take the lens off, right, and you're not careful, it's gonna scrub, it's gonna scratch, it's gonna rub. And that's the problem. The problem isn't the Viltrox lens. The problem is the Fujifilm X mount. It's not just Viltrox. It's any lens that has a large um, mounting diameter. Because some lenses do kind of bow out. So even with the Fujifilm uh, XF50 F1, the knot, because the mount is narrow and then it bows out, it avoids this button. Because Fujifilm realized, like, oops. Why did we make it so close? It's the it's the issue with Fujifilm. It's nothing to do with with Viltrox. Um, and in fact, I think if you go to the Viltrox website, the because they do have a Sony E mount version of all the lenses that are coming out for Fujifilm as well. They even on Viltrox website even says, please be careful when mounting to the X Pro uh, because it, you may scratch. So you're scratching the button. You're not breaking the button, but you will scratch it because of how close how close that mount is. So thank you for that question. Actually, that's something I wanted to, to discuss, but now here I am. I've discussed it here on my live show. Someone men talk, mentioning about missing the D-pad. Yeah, I kind of do miss the D-pad and I do kind of another, I wouldn't mind the D-pad missing if they didn't also get rid of the, the back dial on the X-Pro3 also serves as a button, a second button and I like using that for punching in for magnification. The front dial, it's a hard dial. They got rid of the front dial push in, which I said to Fitch, I'm like, why did you do that? The X-Pro3, that gives you an extra access point, right? So in the front, I used to be able to press in and then you should be able to customize this front button here or something like that. But Fuchim got rid of that. So I don't mind if the, if the D-pad is gone, as long as they give you enough other customizable buttons and the X Pro 3 lacks that front push in. And I think they should have given maybe one more, one more custom button. Well, I mean, there's enough custom buttons, but definitely that front push in was like the one dial that really messed me up in terms of how I set up the X Pro 2. 
I couldn't set up exactly the same. I have to create some workarounds unless I use the touch screen, which I don't like using the touch screen as a dedicated custom because again, because the back screen is closed, if I needed to access a custom feature, I'd have to open it up, swipe, get access, and then close it again. No, 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 no. Because of this being closed, the swipe uh, customized features don't work very well on the X Pro 3. So there are quirks to the X Pro 3. I'm not saying it's perfect. Definitely the X-T4, the X-H1, the X-T3 is the most customizable uh, of all the Fuji films. It has the most buttons and dials. And I really, and the X-T4 is really the best body when it comes to customizing your dials and stuff. But it's just not, I, I, I don't hug my X-T4. It's kind of a tool, right? It's like, it's, like, um, it's like a toaster or a microwave. It works exactly as it was designed for, but it's, it's, it's 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 not like your favorite knife or something like that, right? It's it's not something you always want with you. The X Pro Three is something I always want around me. Uh, Juan asking about me testing the X uh, the TT Artisan. Yeah, I would love to get access to the TT Artisan. Um, I just haven't reached out to them, and they haven't reached out to me to send me the lenses to review. So if anybody knows TT Artisan or even Seven Artisans, I get my Viltrox. Uh, from Per Gear, it's a online retailer out of China. Very legit. They work with me. They work with um, with uh, camera conspiracies. They work with a few of us. Um, they're legit. They're in Shenzhen, which is where all the TT Artisan, DJI, um, Aperture, Godex, they're all in Shenzhen, China. And so Per Gear is in Shenzhen. And in fact, Per Gear may be owned by one of these guys. But it all comes out of Shenzhen. And so um, they've been sending me, and, and Per Gear does represent TT Artisan and Seven Artisan, but I actually like their glass. I like their Per Gear. Per Gear has a 35 F1.2. I want to test that, but I would love to test the TT Artisan and Seven Artisan stuff. I just don't have any contacts there. And I'm just so busy, backed up with other gear that I just don't have time to reach out and say, hey, send me lenses that I won't have time to review. So that's where I'm at when it comes to TT and Seven Artisans. Uh, Igor talking about the XS10, about weather sealing. It's not weather seal, but I've shot with tons of non-weather sealed bodies and it's spitting rain a little bit. Um, I say it's okay, but don't like, don't be in a downpour and even a weather sealed body, don't be in a downpour. I think... Um, weather sealing is less important for rain because even with weather sealing, I shoot with an umbrella. I think most of you, us that shoot in the rain, don't shoot in the rain, right? Like you still shoot under some type of cover. It's humidity is what kills uh, bodies. And so I say for dust. So if you're like in a country that's very dusty, you want a weather sealed body because you don't want dust getting into the body as well as countries that are very humid you want weather sealing. And even for weather sealing, just so you guys know, um, the seals over time wear out. And this is even back in the 80s and the 70s when there's a weather sealed body. The thing is back then there were more mechanical bodies and you can buy seal kits from the manufacturers that will reset, or you can send it back. Like a lot of the Nikonos diving cameras, you have to send it in every couple of years and Nikon will replace all the gaskets and seals to reseal up because they'll say, hey, look, this is weather sealed, but not forever. The gaskets wear out over time. They shrink, especially if you're going from hot to cold, hot to cold. They expand, they contract, expand, they contract. And eventually if it gets too dry, the seals dry out and they crack and it's no longer weather sealed. So you have to get them resealed. These digital cameras, when you first buy them, yes, they're weather sealed. But after about five to six years, they do start to contract unless you're in an environment that's consistently cold or consistently warm, so there is no contraction and retraction, um, the, the seals become less and less effective over time. So if you're buying a 10-year-old, even a, a weather sealed film camera or a 10-year-old weather sealed digital camera, it's not as effective as when it was brand new. So that's the biggest thing about weather sealing. They're not um, a be-all, end-all type thing. A truly weather sealed um gear, anything, when it comes to like diving, we'll have external gaskets where they should be user replaceable so that every two or three years you replace those gaskets. Everything else, like digital cameras and anything else that says, oh, this is a weather sealed camera, it is 
at first, but after a few years and you are just torturing that gear, it loses its weather sealness. But they know that like an iPhone or digital camera in 10 years, no one's really using it uh, as a top end product anyways. So they realize that the sealing ability is maybe only 50% of what it was brand new. But who cares? It's a 10 year old iPhone or 10 year old digital camera, right? So that's just something to think about. So the XT, the XS10 is not weather sealed, but it is still reasonably sealed. Like if it's spitting rain a little bit, you're not going to break the camera. I've shot with cameras that were not weather sealed, like my all my Ricoh GRs, my X100s in the rain, and I'm careful with it. But um, you know, I've never had any issues. Again, it's humidity that will destroy these cameras. Uh, people that live in countries that there's lots of humidity will have um, dehumidifiers, like an actual cabinet where they store all their cameras in the humidity because even when they don't use their cameras, they get fungus on the shutter and they get water penetration in the digital cameras, a humidity penetration, and it just blows their circuitry and destroys their cameras. So they always have to be aware of that. When I was in Thailand, I had a plastic bag and I, whenever I wasn't shooting, I would put because the hotel was air conditioned and I step outside and everything just fogged up. And so I had everything in plastic bags to allow it to um, uh, adjust to the temperature variance from inside to outside. So I wouldn't get all this condensation, not only on the outside of the camera, but also on the inside. Uh, let me see here. Sorry, Momento, I missed your question about the XH2. Sorry about that. Yeah, I'm trying to, I know my camera girl, if she's watching, she'd be like, Taka, you missed. And I'm at 56 minutes now. So let me just try to plow through here. I see questions coming in here. Um, analog medium format camera, Gettens, um, any of the um, the Fujifilm, any of their rangefinder medium formats are great. They were built to be workhorses. So any of the Texas Leicas, but any, any of the 645 ones, like the GS645, uh, those are great, and the any of the the Texas like as the six seven, the six eight, and the six nines. Those are all great, and any of them that are fully mechanical, even some of the fantastic plastic ones like the Pentax six four five and the Mamiya six four fives. Although there are some electronics involved because they have built in meters, they're still mostly mechanical cameras, and so those are all great as well. Someone asked me about the Sigma twenty four to seventy with the Sony A seven three. I haven't used either of them, so I couldn't tell you how well they work, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Um, X100F, if it's a keeper Wayne, some swear by it. My videographer, Chris Meets Chris, he loves his X100F. I like it. I tested the X100V. In a lot of ways, technically, X, not a lot of ways, 100%, X100V technically is a better camera than X100F, but there's little quirks with the X100F, especially that weird lens. It, it's like the, my 23 to, uh, 23 F2 Fujicron. It has the same issue of close focus. It's not a very sharp lens. You've got to really stop it down. But at medium and far distance, it has a kind of unique quality to that lens that a lot of people like. And so a lot of people are, if you look at the used pricing on the X100F, they're still holding the price very well. So I say don't hesitate to buy it. I think it's great. What do you think of Pentax following the digital SLR route? Travis, I think there are people who still prefer to shoot DSLR, but they are a small niche group. And so in terms of a large Japanese camera manufacturer, I think they're making a mistake. If that's all they're focusing on. Leica can get away with selling uh, manual focus rangefinders, but look at the price. They realize, look, we're not going to sell many of these. So let's just make them premium and improve the build quality and just charge a premium. So Pentax is the same, like DSLR's sales are just dying and they're just still focused on it. There may be a comeback in a couple of years, but not right now, especially with so many people wanting to shoot video as well as stills and DSLRs just don't work so well for video. And so unless they can find a workaround with that by using something like a fixed pellicle mirror, um, I don't really see them doing that well, just in general, selling DSLRs in general. Canon and Nikon and, and Sony with the Minolta A-mount aren't doing so well with DSLR sales. 
So I don't know what Pentax thinks they can do to revive that, but I mean, power to them. I did ask if I can review their uh, Pentax K1 and their new uh, top of line uh, APS-C just to play with it, just to see for myself what I think, but it's definitely a steals camera. Um, are we having a video for the discontinuation of the F6? Yeah, I think we should. I think technically they stopped making them years ago. They just had parts for it. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to own a Nikon F6 just for sake of nostalgia, but really of all the Fs, I'd probably buy, buy an F3 anyways. And that's probably my favorite of the pro F series of the original F, F2, F3, F4, F5, F6. I think I like the F3 the best. The one I like the least is the F4. Uh, let me just catch up here. Um, I'm actually caught up now. So I'm going to go kind of backwards. Let me see here. What do you think about upcoming? Oh, there we go. Oh, I already got that far. Um, Reno talking about a full frame X100. Yeah, they're just not going to do it because you've seen the, the size of the the Sony R, R1X, X1R, R1X, R1. The Canon, the Sony R1 and the the Leica Q, we, we've seen the size of those, right? That's the kind of size you're going to get with a full frame leaf shutter point and shoot. And I think for the size and weight compromise, definitely I think Fujifilm has it right. The sensors on the APS-Cs now are so good that if you compare with, um, like I compared the, the, the Fujifilm 26 megapixel sensor with the new SL2 Q2 sensor, with the, it's the 47 megapixel at for in terms of high ISO noise, the, the Sony 26 megapixel APS-C handles noise better because the pixel density is actually lower on that APS-C sensor than the 47 megapixel um, tower jazz sensor that's in the SL2 as well as in the Q2 as well as in the uh, the Panasonic bodies because there's so much pixel density. I think that they made a mistake and they should have made it 36 megapixel, which will be about the same pixel density as 26 meg megapixel on the APS-C and it would handle ice high ISO noise better. And so um, I think this is great. I think the X100V noise control is really good. So I don't think there's an advantage really other than uh, getting shallower depth of field at the equivalent focal length. Um, RX1, thank you. Sony RX1, yeah. Look at the size of those cameras at F2, right? They're just so huge. I think Sony, I mean, Fujifilm, to be able to create, I mean, this is the lens hood, right? I have the X70 lens hood. But, you know, this is basically the size of, actually, I even have the, the cap on it. I mean, look, look, look how small that lens is compared to the Sony and the Leica. That is a very flat lens. And, of course, you can tell how far back the lens is, see how it's a sensor, that little circle with a line tells you where the sensor is, right? So that's where the sensor is. So half the lens is actually inside the body. And that's how they can keep the IQ so good because the closer the rear element of the lens is to the sensor, the better the IQ because there's less air space between the lens and the sensor. And that's why range finders in general, all things being equal, had sharper glass and also mirrorless glass will be sharper and you can make them brighter as long as the 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 um, flange diameter is bigger and the new canon the r mount the full frame mirrorless mount they're creating these amazing 24 to 70 f2s because they've increased the diameter size and the flange back distance is much uh, shorter than what was on the dslrs because of the they need to make room for that mirror and so that's why the glass on the r series the rf glass is going to be better than their slr glass because the rear element is much closer but in an all-in-one camera like this you have that sense look how far back again the sensor is it's really far back in the body so half the lens is in the body so the sensor and the body is so close you can get just sharper images and so i think APS-C is a, is a definitely a good decision and so thank you so much for joining guys it is now one hour and four minutes thank you so much for joining there's 130 of you on right now and so i appreciate so much if i didn't miss your question i do apologize um i didn't have a moderator with me this time um you can if you can re-ask the question in the comment 
comment section. I will definitely answer it there or wait for my next week's show. So thank you. I'm going to actually take a screenshot here to show that I had 130 or well, 122 now because I'm talking about wrapping up. But thank you so much for joining, guys. I do appreciate it. Thank you for your 41 likes. If you can like now, that'd be great. And uh, again, ask my questions down below. Let me know if this timing is good for you. If it is, then I'm going to try to keep it this time because it's a good time for me. I apologize to my Asian friends. The, that one that's in Indonesia, it's probably 3 in the morning for you right now. So I apologize. And I will try to do a time that is Asia-centric just for you guys. All right? So thanks for watching. And let's just close this off with the happy shooting. But this time I'm going to use my film camera. And happy shooting. All right. Peace.